Scotty was just a, a different type of astronaut from the other ones. He was uh, more lyrical, is probably the word I'd uh, say. He was more interested in exploring the environment than piloting the Mercury capsule, but he was hired as a pilot uh, as opposed to explore the environment. I had a flight plan that uh, was devoted to science where the other uh, flight plans were more devoted to engineering, looking at the spacecraft itself instead of where the spacecraft got us. At first, everything seemed fine. Carpenter even solved the riddle of Glenn's fireflies by proving they came from the spacecraft. The phenomenon would eventually be traced to frozen condensation on the outside of the ship. I could see that they emanated from the capsule by wrapping on the hatch. We didn't know where those things came from. There was some conjecture that there would be some sort of living critters out there at that altitude. Sounds crazy now, but we didn't know a lot of very simple answers in those early days. Now we know. Carpenter named his spacecraft Aurora 7, a reflection of the scientific nature of both mission and pilot. The three-orbit duplicate of Glenn's flight was filled with things to do, balloons to deploy, observations to make. Scott was having a ball. Throughout the entire flight, it became very obvious that he, we were getting behind in, uh, in the use of the uh, attitude control uh, propellants to the point where by the, th actually the second, or second orbit, we had advised uh, uh, Scotty to go into periods of drifting flight. The uh, third one, we told him to basically shut down and move into drifting flight. And as he arrived over uh, Hawaii for uh, the orbit, uh, he had cameras out and he was trying to take some pictures of these uh, snowflakes they were seeing out there. He was attempting to uh, identify their source as opposed to getting ready for retrofire uh, to the point where he was not uh, in the orientation needed for retrofire and he was behind in his checklist. Carpenter was in trouble. Things were coming too fast and he was starting to miss key deadlines. Having failed to put the capsule on the right heading, he fired his retro rockets three seconds late and entered the atmosphere 25 degrees off yaw. The combined errors would land him far off course, if they didn't kill him first. Trying to guide the overheated and wildly bucking craft through the atmosphere, Carpenter tried to put it into a slow roll in an effort to let it heat more evenly. But his fuel was exhausted. Now he could only rely on the strength of Mercury's original design. I'm not sure when I ran out of fuel on the, uh, on the entry. It was down low, but what I was able to determine is that Max Faget's design of the blunt re-entry body uh, was a good one and it had sufficient aerodynamic stability to get through the entry without fuel. And that's what Max wanted it to do. Mission Control dispatched their recovery ships to the new splashdown point, now estimated to be 250 miles east, and the world held its breath. With no word from NASA since Carpenter began his re-entry, reporters covering the flight assumed the worst. CBS News anchor Walter Cronkite had been the unofficial narrator of the manned space program from the beginning, preparing his audience for what he soon expected to hear from NASA. He announced on live television that, it appears we may have lost an astronaut. They knew that Carpenter was alive. We did not. They had telemetry, heartbeat, respiration, so forth. And they were getting those signals. He was alive, he'd come through. They did not tell us for 43 minutes. We were all put in the position of assuming that he was dead and of wondering how we were going to tell this story and when they were going to let us know about it. And they never did, not until they said they, now they saw the parachutes open. I've seen that broadcast. And uh, there were other people concerned. 
But I was not. Frankly, I knew exactly where I was. Carpenter's flight was hailed as a rousing success. Project Mercury had made great strides, and NASA was clearly on its way. Meanwhile, inside the agency, Christopher Kraft fumed that Carpenter would never fly for him again. He made it stick, too. Aurora 7 was Scott Carpenter's only space flight. I don't want to uh, appear to condemn Scott Carpenter. Uh, Scott Carpenter, he's a fine person, but nevertheless, he was not what I considered to be a competent test pilot. And we wanted test pilots there because they might find themselves in the position that he indeed found himself in. And he was very fortunate that he was able to get the spacecraft down uh, without serious trouble. He and I have uh, been on opposite sides of, uh, of my, the appraisal of my flight. He, think it, he thinks it involves the the failure of the man, and I think it involves the failure of the machine. And I think there, the, there is no meeting between the two of us. The perception was that if the team was let down by anybody in those days, there was always the threat that the politicians would pull the plug on the whole thing. I don't know that it's necessarily a fair assessment. I think if any of us could say that we've gone up there and done what the Mercury 6 did um, and come home at all, <laughs> is quite an accolade.